pay him later. If you are a guy and you have a phone conversation, it will be over in 30 seconds or less, and you will get to the point. If you are a guy and you're going away on a five-day vacation, you need one bag. If you are a guy and you are clicking through the channels and someone is crying on the channel, you don't have to stop to find out why they are crying. You can simply keep moving on. If you are a guy and you go to a car mechanic, he will tell you the truth. <laughs> don't be like, whoa, that's too close to home for some people. I get it, I get it. If you are a guy, you can admire Clint Eastwood and not feel like you have to starve yourself to look like him. If you are a guy, gray hair and wrinkles make you look distinguished. And if you show up at a party and another guy is dressed exactly the same, you just made a new best friend. It is good to be a guy. I've liked it. I liked it so much I decided to have two boys. A young boy once said that Father's Day is a lot like Mother's Day, only you spend less money on the gift. So this morning, we are going to dive into one of the most manliest men of the Bible. And I just want you to kind of put a little note in the back of your head, you think who it is. Now, as men, we are fascinated with, I don't know, violence, with men who do incredible feats of strength. Think about some of our favorite movies, Braveheart, Rocky, Rambo, Gladiator, 300. We are obsessed with men who do incredible feats of strength to defeat the villain. We love these movies, and every one of us secretly thinks, if I was in that situation, I would do the exact same thing. And we're drawn to them because the men in these movies are overcoming odds and defeating villains using this extraordinary willpower, this extraordinary strength. They're, they're drawn on something that is far greater than them. And the person we're going to talk about this morning comes from the book of Judges. It comes from four chapters, 13 through 16. In the book of Judges is a man by the name of Samson, right, good. You guys, half of you had it right, and the other half of you didn't want to say anything out loud because you got it wrong. So Samson is young, strong, and courageous, and incredibly cocky, and a ladies' man. He is everything that a guy wants to be, right? If we think of Samson in the Bible, what's the first thing that comes to mind? His, his hair? His strength. Let's not offend certain people in this room, okay? The second thing we think about is his hair, right? And uh, Samson, basically, he embodies a lot of the things that we find fascinating, and we get into his story. And we're not going to spend the whole morning going into all the chapters and all his escapades and, and everything that he did. I'm fascinated with a few things. I've done a lot of study on some different angles on, uh, but we don't have time this morning to go into all of that. But what I want to do is kind of paint a picture and share with you some of the things that even though we see Samson as the strongest man in the Bible, he in fact was one of the weakest. And I really want to try to drive that point home this morning. I think Samson is an example of a man who could have done so much more. Now, if Samson were alive today, he would be the, the all-star athlete. He would be the movie star. He would be it all rolled into one. Paparazzi would be around him all the time. Everyone would love him. He'd be on the cover of all the magazines. But at the end, he would still be a disappointment. And I think Samson shows us a picture of how men fail, and in, in particular, how strong men can still fail. And I really truly believe that strong, talented, godly men should be the pillars of not only our homes, but our churches and our communities. But unfortunately, they are not. And I think we all can benefit from the story of Samson, uh, from, from the message of, of Samson. Even those uh, at this moment, if you don't feel like you're teetering on the edge of some great moral abyss, uh, there's still a lot to be learned from him. Uh, perhaps like Samson, you have been richly blessed and gifted by God. Maybe you sense a call on your life. Uh, you, you have a great job. People look up to you. You got a great wife. You got beautiful kids. But in the midst of all this, something is wrong. Maybe you feel yourself drifting away. Uh, you're not as passionate about the things of God as you used to be. Your marriage, though it's not bad, it just doesn't satisfy you like it used to. Uh, maybe you're, you have feelings, you're being drawn uh, to 
things that should be off limits for a person of faith. Maybe you've dabbled in a sin, maybe dabbled in these things, you know, in secret, of course. Uh, but maybe you feel the grip of sin just kind of tightening in around your life. And we all find ourselves in these moments sometime in life. Now, whether we're currently in a sunny season or a dark season of life, we can all learn from Samson. Now, we're not going to go into the whole thing. I'll just give you a brief background about what's going on. We're roughly 250 years from the moment that Joshua stormed into the promised land to conquer the land. In the, in the time since then, we, we talk about it frequently, the Israelites go through moments where they are following good, they're doing right in the eyes of the Lord, and then they turn away from God, they start worshiping uh, the idols that are around them, then they start to get oppressed by the, uh, the neighboring countries, and then they cry out to God for, for salvation, for help, and God sends them a deliverer. Now we're in the book of Judges. Now Judges, we think of Judges, we think of the nice white hair and the black robe and all that. The Judges that we're actually talking about, they are military leaders. They are significant men or women that have like a military mindset, military conquest. So when we think of Judges, we have to kind of readjust how we view them. In our situation this morning, when we look at Samson, uh, Samson 13, 1, we see the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. So now with the Israelites are under the oppression of the Philistines. The Philistines kind of dominate that. If you keep reading through chapter 13, this is where the story of Samson starts to come into play. A couple of parents, they're older, later on in life, they want a child. An angel of the Lord comes to them and says, look, we're going to give you a son, but he's going to be special. You're going to set him apart for the work of the Lord. And basically, the angel says he is to take the Nazarite vow. Now, the next question is, what's the vow? The vow you can find in Numbers chapter 6, and it basically consists of three main ingredients. The first one being that you cannot get drunk, or go anything near uh, that comes from a grapevine. You've got to stay away from the grapevine, stay away from anything that uh, uh, you can't eat or drink of anything like that. The second thing is the one that we're pretty familiar with in this story is you cannot cut your hair. This is an outward symbol showing everyone around you that I have taken the Nazarene vow. This is what is going on in my life. It's an outward uh, symbol of what's going on on the inside. And then the third one is you cannot go near or touch anything that is dead. So you're not going to any funerals, you're not approaching anything that is dead. So this is the vow that Samson, for his whole life, is to adhere to. Now, frequently in the Bible, they'll take the Nazarene vow for a period of 30 to 60 days. Typically, it's a short-lived kind of vow to go through things. Not many in the scriptures have taken this as a lifelong vow. John the Baptist is one that we consider to also have taken uh, this Nazarite vow. So we get to the end of Judges uh, 13. We get to verse 24. It says, The woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir in him, Mahane Don, uh, between Zorah and Eshtaol. So now we're going to jump into a little bit of the warnings of Samson. And hopefully there's some familiarity with what's going on with Samson. We're going to cover a few of the incidents, uh, a few of the things that happened in his life this morning. But in the end, we all know what the end carries. We know what the end of Samson's life is. We kind of are familiar with some of the stories if you've grown up in Sunday school. So we're going to kind of uh, walk through some of the incidents in his life and some of the warning signs that maybe we should uh, key in on. The first thing we want to take notice of is that Samson toyed with sin. He played around with sin. He took it far too lightly. We get into uh, the, a, few a few verses into uh, chapter 14. And in the early uh, chapter 14, Samson is actually cruising around a Philistine city looking for a girl, looking for lots of girls. <laughs> Basically, he is cruising a Philistine city, checking out the babes. And he comes and he finds one that he actually likes, and he wants to marry her. So now we find him on his way to show his girl to his parents. In verse uh, 5, it says, Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Dun, dun, dun. Then the Spirit of the Lord, and this would be a part where I would underline in my Bible, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. 
But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she was right in Samson's eyes. That's another key point there, in Samson's eyes. After some days, he returned to take her, and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. And he scraped it out into his hand and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some to them, and they ate. But he did not tell them that he had scraped the honey from the carcass of the lion. Why didn't he tell them? He wasn't supposed to be near the dead lion. Which vow did he break? The third one, stay away from dead things. Now, what's interesting about this story, there was nothing that dragged him back to the lion. He chose to go down that route. He chose to look and see what he had done. He himself brought himself to the point of sin. He was messing around with it. Now, had it been me, I would have had all my friends, I would have had all their friends to come check out this wonderful thing that I had just did. I ripped a lion apart with my bare hands. By the way, if you have any trouble with lions, I will be glad to come around and rip them apart with my bare hands as well. It would be a nice little show trick I would do. I would just go to parties and hope that lions show up and then rip them apart and then uh, come back later and collect honey. I guess that's how it works. So Samson is messing around with sin on his own. No temptation. And he, you know he knew something was wrong because he brought it back to his parents and he didn't tell them what was going on. Pride led him to the carcass. He was flirting with sin. He's not supposed to be near it. And his, I can only imagine, like, he knew what was going on. If parents had prayed for a son, they have a son, the angel of the Lord said, look, this is how you're supposed to raise your kid. What do you think he was learning his whole life? How are you supposed to live? He's like, he's in, a, he's in grade school. He's like, Mom, Dad, look, I want that haircut that Pastor Sam has. No, we can't cut your hair because the angel of the Lord says we can't cut your hair. You're taking a Nazarite vow. You're going to go on through that. Well, why can't I go over here? You know, I can't visit the funeral. We can't go in near any dead things. Well, how come you can have a glass of wine, but I can't have any grape juice? Well, you're not allowed to go anything near the vine. His whole life, he's being taught all these things. He knows exactly what he is being groomed for. His parents are speaking into him. I can only uh, uh, believe that his whole life he knows that he is set apart for something special. But in this case, he breaks the rule, and that leads to the big question. If a man breaks a rule, if a man sins, and no one is there to see it, did it happen? The answer is yes. And far too many uh, men uh, in life think that if they sin in secret, no one is going to get harmed in this process. Ecclesiastes 12, 14, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Psalm 44, 21, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Psalm 69, 5, O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Psalm 139, 1 through 3, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. I know, you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Men, there are no secrets with God. Let's look at Daniel. Let's con contrast this thing with Daniel. Now, Daniel is a man who, uh, a young man who is blessed by God with, with knowledge, with physical attributes. Whatever it is, he rose up in the ranks and actually was taken away to a foreign land. And in that foreign land, through all that their training, he actually rose up to be high in leadership there. And what the problem was with Daniel, Daniel's a foreigner and he's having great success. So the other leaders that are working with him are starting to get a little bit jealous. And they're trying to figure out a way to take Daniel down. They want to knock him down a peg. And they started to investigate and search and really found nothing wrong with Daniel. And verse 4 says, The high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. So what do you do? You're trying to get a guy in trouble. You can't figure out a way to get him in trouble because he's too good. He's too perfect. So what do you do? You make up a rule. You make up a law to get him in trouble. Verse 5, then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. They knew the only weakness of Daniel was his relationship with God. How awesome would that be if someone thought the only way they could get at you is to mess with your relationship with God? 
He is so strong, so significant that they had to try to find some way to make it illegal to worship God. So they get together, they get around the king, and they get the king to sign into decree, make a law that says, for the next 30 days, you cannot worship anyone or anything except for the king. And it goes into law. So for the next 30 days, technically, Daniel is not to pray to God. And I love how Daniel responds to this law. This is one of my most favorite passages, my favorite interactions, I think, that goes far and notice. The first line of verse 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, it's very clear he knows what the rule is. He knows what the law is. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Here's a part I have underlined. As he had done previously. He shrugged it off. He was, had no concern of this law that was trying to separate him from his relationship with God. His walk with God was that real. Even when facing trouble and punishment, he did not keep his walk with God a secret. Now we know what ends up happening, right? They find him. They bring him to the king and say, look, he disobeyed this law that we've put out there. The king is actually distraught over it. This isn't what he wanted to have happen, but law is law. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den, and then he rips apart the lions. No, God shuts the mouths of the lions. The lions are the running theme, I guess, this morning. Shuts the mouth of the lions, and Daniel survives the day, the night. The king rushes to him the next morning. Daniel's good to go. The king says, you know what? This was kind of a bad move on these guys' part throws them into the lion's den, and the lions are no longer hungry. So here's the thing. If, a, if your enemy has to toy with your faith to try to get at you, then something is going good. So Daniel did not, do his, uh, did not live his faith in secret. Now, the next thing we look at Samson, the next step is Samson severely lacked discernment. And there's a few different areas in his life that kind of exemplify this. Uh, when we first see Samson, our first interaction with him, he's actually mingling with the enemy. He's so enamored by what's going on with the Philistines, he's spending time in their cities. He's, uh, he's enamored with the very people that he's supposed to rescue his, uh, his uh, tribe from. And we see that he's not relying on the scriptural upbringings, but on the social temptations that are around him. And uh, far too often, many of our biblical leaders today are being swayed by the social uh, temptations as opposed to the scriptures. And Samson kind of falls right in there. The quality traits that are so prevalent in Samson uh, are the same traits that make him enemies of discernment. And the first one we see is pride. In Judges 14.3, he comes back after seeing uh, this woman of Timnah. He comes back and he says to his father and mother, said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of of your relatives or among all our people that you must go take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistine. But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. He's very concerned about what's going on with him. Later on in his life, we go down to uh, Judges chapter 15, we find an incident where the Philistines are actually harassing uh, the Israelites, trying to get Samson. And so what happens is 3,000 uh, men, 3,000 soldiers from Judah get together, go to Samson and say, hey, look, they're trying to find you. They're messing with us. Can, will you go with us? Can we turn you over to the Philistines? So he goes with them, goes into the situation. Uh, the the 3,000 men turn him over to the Philistines, and that's where we get in verse 14 of chapter 15. It says that when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Another thing I have underlined and the ropes that were on his arms became his flax, that it caught fire. His bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it. And with it, he struck a thousand men. This is like epic warrior awesomeness. This is just sweet. So it's one on a thousand, and he takes them all out. Now notice in verse 14, it said what? The spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. But I want you to see in verse 16 how he acknowledges his victory. Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down a thousand men. Does it sound like someone who's giving credit to God? He's got an issue with pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. 
Another trait of Samson that goes against discernment is anger. Samson uh, is uh, at the wedding party now. He's getting ready to marry uh, the woman uh, of Timnah, and, and uh, he decides, I'm going to come up with a little riddle. So he comes up with a riddle that only he could possibly know the answer to. Verse 14, 14 says, Out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet, and in three days they could not solve the riddle. Basically, he says, look, you figure this out at the end of seven days, and then I'll, you know, I'll give you 30 garments. If you can't figure it out, you have to give me 30 garments. In verse uh, 18, in, the, in between that, the, the men, they can't figure out the answer, so they end up going to Samson's fiance, and they say, look, give us the answer, give us the answer. Eventually, she pulls the answer out of Samson, takes it and gives it the answer to the men, little foreshadowing here. So, in, uh, so this, the men have the answer and at the end of the seventh day, basically the last possible moment they can give the answer. The men of the city, in verse 18, said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And then Samson calmly replies to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. And then he proceeds to go out into the city uh, in verse 19, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. He went out to Ashkelon and struck down 30 men of the town, took their spoil, and gave the garments to those who had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. So he got so upset that these guys were able to figure it out, his little riddle. He was so mad, he went out, killed 30 men, took their garments, turned them in as uh, what he had to pay off, uh, pay off his debt, and then he runs home, basically. He's so mad, he just runs home back to his father. Psalm 37, 8 says, Refrain from anger. Forsake wrath, fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. So he had a little problem with anger. In uh, the next trait that Samson has that's kind of an enemy of discernment is lust. And I think this is one we can all easily attribute or easily find. Uh, basically, four, in verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, we find him roaming around Timnah looking at all the Philistine women. Uh, in, 16, in chapter 16, we run into him. He's actually in Gaza, another Philistine city, uh, hanging out with prostitutes. And then, of course, in, uh, later on in that same chapter, he finds he runs into this little old lady named Delilah. And we all know where things uh, go from there. Unfortunately, there's a pattern in his life of constantly chasing girls, constantly chasing the wrong girls, Philistines, and not Israelites. In the 1970s, United Airlines uh, put together a program for businessmen where your wife flies for free. So what would happen to business, you're going on a trip, you'd be able to bring uh, your wife along with you, she can go on the trip with you, and she flies for free, you pay for your ticket. But they soon had to cancel this, because what happened is, after they would fly on the trip, they would send a letter to the house, to the address, say, thank you for flying with us, thank you for taking advantage of this program, we would like to see, yes, yeah, so, so holy, I'm not even halfway through the story, guys. So they had to cancel, because they, <laughs> everyone knows the company, they are constantly getting inundated with phone calls who went on this trip? I didn't even know about this program. What are you talking about? Who is it? Who sent? And they had to eventually shut it down. This is the problem with the men. They had issues with lust. They took advantage of the situation. Proverbs 6.32 says, He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. Now, the next trait that Samson had that is an enemy of discernment was greed. And we'll go right back to the story at the wedding party. He's at a wedding party. People are coming to a wedding party. What do you bring when you go to a wedding party? Gifts, right? Or a pen so you can put your name on someone else's card. They bring gifts. He's already receiving gifts. He's receiving stuff, but that's not enough for him. He wants more. He wants to seem smarter. He wants to seem bigger. He wants more stuff. And we say, this is where, in verse 12, he put that riddle out there. Let me put a riddle to you if you can tell me what it is within the seven days of feast and find out I will give you 30 linen, linen garments and 30 changes of clothes but if you cannot tell me then you shall give me 30 linen gar garments and 30 changes of clothes and they said to him put your riddle out that we may hear it he just wasn't satisfied with what was going on he wanted more not just more stuff but he wanted like another leg up on everyone it was another pride moment uh, he, he wanted more. He had a problem with greed. Proverbs 1, 18 uh, and 19 says, But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. Now I look at this, and then we can look at the life of Joseph. 
And just that small incident, we can take a few things out of the small incident of Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Remember the story, Potiphar's wife was kind of sweet on Joseph and eventually gets to a situation where it's just her and him in the house alone. Potiphar's wife makes a significant advance towards him, grabbing a hold of his coat. Joseph ultimately is able to, to get rid of the coat, flees, and there's a whole process. But in the midst of this, we see a whole lot about the discernment of Joseph. The first thing we see about Joseph is he took time to look at his blessings. And I know this is unusual because at this point he's a slave, but he still acknowledges that there is blessings in his life. In uh, 39 eight, he says, He refused, said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He acknowledges he's actually in a good place uh, from where he could be at. Uh, he is looking where he has been, looking where he is. He knows things are going good. The next thing we see from Joseph is he looks at his integrity. He has integrity. And uh, in verse 9, we see the segment, How then can I do this great wickedness? Now, at this time, it is just them in this house. He could probably get away with it, but he has a greater uh, purpose, a greater goal in life. He has a greater God leading him, and he keeps those. He has chosen to live at a higher code, even if no one else could find out. And the next thing we see from Joseph, he is looking forward. At the end of verse 9, it says, Because you are his wife. He knows very well, no matter what happens out of this relationship, this is a married woman. Where could this relationship possibly go? Joseph knows it could not go anywhere. That's a small part of it. What good would it be for him to engage in this kind of relationship? Now, let me ask you a question. If I said we're going to take a flight from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, okay, and there's a 50% chance the plane is going to crash, how many of you would get on the plane? How many of you would find someone else to take the ride for you? No, just kidding. Let's not go there. Okay, what if it's just 25%? 10? You wouldn't do it, right? Yet, when we commit ourselves to sin, there is literally a 100% chance of crashing. It might not be now. It might not be tomorrow. But eventually, when we commit ourselves to sin, there's a 100% chance of crashing, and constantly we dive into it. The last thing Joseph did, showing discernment, is he looked up. And this is one of the great uh, lines from Joseph, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph saw God as more gratifying, more important, more awesome, more significant than Potiphar's wife. And the flip side, Samson saw women as more desirable than God. I think one of the saddest things we see about our strong man, Samson, is the point that Samson appears did life on his own. Now, truth be told, a lot of the judges were kind of isolated individuals. They kind of ruled on their own, but they're constantly reflecting on God. God is constantly speaking to them. Samson, we see time and time again, imagine how different his life would be if someone would just be there to smack him, basically, just to say, hey, maybe we shouldn't do this. So I want to give you some advice, some good advice. I think this is something you can take away with you to kind of help you out. When you are depressed, listen to country music. The people in the songs will always be more messed up than you are. Next one, I would say always buy your parents nice stuff because you do not want to inherit junk. <laughs> if you're having trouble opening a childproof bottle, leave it in a room with a child. And the last one, pretty significant for some of you, don't bother naming your cat. He's not going to come when you call him anyways. <laughs> some words to live by. But Samson did life alone. We see him constantly. He is when he's uh, walking around Timnah trying to search a wife, he's by himself. When he goes to the wedding, they see him come in verse 11. As soon as his people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. He didn't even get to pick his own group. Like, he didn't have people to be his group. And turns out, his best man was not all that great because when he got upset and he went home, he, you know, he killed these guys, he went home to, to pout, he comes back to take his wife, his future father-in-law says, oh, by the way, I already gave her to your best man. Yeah, great, thanks. 
So even that situation wasn't working out for him. Then we get to another, the next situation, things start to escalate a little bit. Another really cool Samson thing, he a is able to capture 300 foxes. I don't know how he does it, uses a trap, runs and grabs them by the tail. I have no clue. That's one of the questions you ask when you get up there. And so 300 foxes, ties them up in pairs, lights their tails on fire. They run out and destroy all the crops. There's a great spiritual significance to the crops that they destroyed. We'll get into that at another time. Goes out there, destroys all the crops, really upsets the Philistines. They decide, we're going to get this guy. That's when they gathered together. That's when we find the 3,000 men of Judah who came and said, look, the Philistines, they're kind of upset with you. If you'll just come with us and go, then the, everything will be okay. So the 3,000 men delivered him to the Philistines. Then the next incident, we've already covered this, he kills 1,000 men with the jawbone of a donkey by himself. What were the 3,000 men doing? <laughs> that's, probably, that's what I would be doing. Actually, I'd probably get in there and anyone who's left over, just me and Samson did a thousand, just the two of us. But he did it by himself. No one was there to assist him. No one was there to speak life into him. Now, in Judges 15, 20, we're, we're not at the end of Samson's story, but it kind of wraps up his reign as a judge. It says, in 1520, it says, he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. When you go through the book of Judges, you'll find, when you get to the, you'll find whatever happened with the judge, whatever incidents, whatever things they walked through, and then at the end of the reign, it tells you how long they reigned. That's kind of how they cap the whole story off. But this case is a little bit different because we're not done with the story. At the end of chapter 15, we have yet to run into Delilah. So we find uh, that there's kind of like a, but wait, there's more kind of a story. And I can't help but think that if he had someone speaking into his life that this might not have happened. This whole ending of his life would not have happened in this way. We find that in, in verse six, or chapter 16, he travels a great distance. He goes to Gaza, one of the southernmost uh, cities of the Philistines. Why is he going that far? Perhaps to get away from his own kingdom, to begin to partake in some more secret sins, things that he feels he can get away with. Uh, basically, it's like he's coming out of sin retirement. He's reigned, he's got, uh, he's got a taste for what he used to have, uh, and he's kind of going down that path. A good friend, a friend of accountability, uh, someone would have interjected uh, in any of these circumstances. The only people you really see speaking life into Samson throughout his story are his parents, and he dis dismissed them so quickly. And it's just like any other you know, teenage boy. You, your parents can tell you all they want to until you hear it from someone else, right? You didn't hear it at all. Now, Samson's personality, I think, drove people away. He's arrogant, he's boastful, he's selfish, he's prideful, he's greedy, uh, he's big and strong, that's intimidating. But I want to tell you, that Samson was definitely blind before he was blinded. Even after the whole incident with the woman from Timnah, remember, like, she drew out his secret and then she told someone else, does that sound like something's going to happen in his future? Delilah is going to draw out his secret and going to tell it to someone else? We need somebody on our side to kind of help get ahead and help see our blind spots. So I want to take this and compare it to a story of David. David, a man after God's own heart. We find David in the book uh, of 1 Samuel chapter 25. It's a unique situation. David is an outlaw at this point in time. He's running away from Saul. He's living out in the wilderness. It's got, you got David and uh, his key soldiers, his men that are surrounding him. And in this particular situation, he is in the fields or in the territory of a rich man named Nabal. Now, Nabal, it's a time of the year where he is gathering up his flocks, bringing all his sheep in to shear them. This is basically where a rich man finds out how rich he actually is, because he is harvesting, he is collecting all his crops. David, during this time, decides, you know what, we've been out here in the fields, I need some more food. Some... So he goes to Nabal and says, look, can you give me some food? We've been taking care of all your, all your flocks. We haven't killed any, any of your sheep for food. We haven't, uh, we, you know, we protected you, haven't had any loss. The reason why things are going so good for you right now is because we were out there protecting you. Can you then take care of us? Now, Nabal was a bit of a hothead, understood that David was an outlaw of the king, and said, no way, Jose, not going to happen. Then we see in verse 13 of chapter 25, David said to his men, every man strap on his sword, and every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword, and about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the luggage. So David said, all right, we protect you all this time. You're not going to give me anything great. I'm just going to destroy you. And he's getting ready to head that direction. This is where God used Nabal's wife, Abigail. Abigail caught wind of what was going on through servants, 
and ran out to meet David to get ahead of it. And she was, uh, she basically sat down and talked with him and walked him through the proceedings. Basically saying, this is not something you want to do. You eventually are going to be king. Is this a mark that you want on your resume? Kind of calming him down, letting him know this is not you. This is not who you are supposed to be. You have better things waiting in store for you. And after she goes on and explains all this, now she did come bearing gifts and, and kind of soften it all up. But she let him know the choice he was about to make was not a good choice and gave him an alternative. And then we see towards the end of 25, David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you, who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from working salvation with my own hand. God sent Abigail to reveal David's blind spot, to let him know that the action you're about to take is wrong. So as I close, uh, the few things I want to share with the men and something I want to I'm keep trying to hammer home in my own life and, and remind myself day after day, uh, is a few things as men of God, that, a few things that we need. As men of God, we need accountability. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Now, when someone is holding you accountable, that's not fun because they are going to, in love, tell you what you are doing wrong. That hurts. But in the long run, it is good. We need that pruning. We need someone to come alongside of us and help us direct ourselves towards Christ. The next thing we need as men of God, we need God's word. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. The next thing we need as men uh, of God, we need the Holy Spirit. And this is the one I'm, I'm constantly trying to work on in my own life to maximize uh, the Holy Spirit's movings in my own life. And I think if we really comprehended the power of the Holy Spirit, our lives would be dramatically changed. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, There is therefore no con now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And Romans 8, 6 says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. When we look at the life of Samson, we see that in the battles, the spirit of the Lord took over. But when we get to those moments of temptation, where is the spirit of the Lord? I think it's being squashed. I think Samson doesn't want the spirit of the Lord to take control. He is squelching the spirit in those situations and taking control of his own life. Ephesians 5, 15 through 18, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. I have two boys that are grown up. When, I, when they were younger, man, I would take them and I would toss them around everywhere. I was the strongest person they knew. I was their Samson. And I would take full advantage. I would throw them on the bed. I'd throw them here. They would hit their heads on things. Not my fault. They should have. But I was the strongest person you know. But now they're getting bigger. And I can't throw them nearly as far, if at all. And there's two of them. So eventually they're going to be able to gather up on me, and they will be stronger than I am. doesn't matter how often I go to the gym. Eventually they're going to be able to overtake me in strength. So I don't have that over them anymore. What I do want is to have spiritual strength. I want to be so strong and so chasing after God that in order for them to catch me and to overtake me in their spiritual walk, they have to get closer to God. Physically, they'll overtake me. It's going to happen. I'm getting older. I feel it. But spiritually, I want them to overtake me. I want this to happen. I want them to be so close to God that if they're chasing and trying to overtake me, that their relationship with God, and it's just going to be a beautiful uh, thing in their life. And I think that is every desire of a godly father should be that their children are, are chasing to overtake them spiritually. How awesome would that be? A couple words of encouragement. How do we live like strong men of God? The first thing we should do is live upright like Daniel. We should display discernment like Joseph. And we should adhere to accountability like David. And above all things, put God first. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We address you as Father. How amazing is that? That you care for us like children. 
that you love us like children. God, today we want to commit ourselves. I, I, I'm, I'm striving to be a man of God so that my children are a better man of God than I am. And there are fathers out here to, who desire the same thing. And it is never too late to make an impression on your children. God, stir up the men in this church to be strong men of God, that we can set the examples for our families. Encourage the women in this room, God, that to, to be an encouragement and enhancement of a, men's, of a man's walk with God. We thank you for this family that you put together here at Community Church. May our community be impacted because of the way we walk with you, God. It's your great holy name we pray. Amen. God bless and happy Father's Day.